I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by John Townley, a writer, historian, editor, author, photojournalist, recording artist, producer, and publicist. His books and articles range from scholarly papers for the halls of academia to unabashed tabloid feature writing. In the editorial publishing chair, he's had a daily, weekly, monthly, and quarterly magazines, both on staff and freelance. John has produced recordings for labels as wide-ranging as Columbia Records and the National Geographic Society. Designed and built the first 12-track recording studios in New York and San Francisco, and is the founding president of the Confederate Naval Historical Society. John's also the former program developer at the Mariners Museum in Newport News and New York South Street Seaport Museum, and his papers have been published by the Society for Historical Archaeology, Mystic Seaport Museum, and the U.S. Naval Academy. He joins us today to discuss seriality, a phenomenon that he has studied extensively and been cited by numerous subject matter experts on in publications such as Psychology Today. So, John, welcome, sir. Thank you so much for joining me today. Delighted to be here. So today we're discussing seriality. This is, for a lot of people, I think, a rather obscure concept, but I think something that we've all encountered, which is what makes it so exciting. Um, the idea was originally developed by Austrian biologist Dr. Paul Kammerer, who had a hobby of collecting coincidence stories. So I'm wondering, can you start us out with a bit of an explanation about what this concept is for seriality and why Kammerer developed it? Well, actually, uh, it was, a, I guess, as you would say, it's sort of a hobby, sort of a, 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 a something else he did. Paul Kammerer was actually a a very well-known biologist at the turn of the century, turn of, not this century, last century. The last forgetting century, it. yeah. That's right, it's easy to forget these days. Uh, and uh, in Vienna, which was one of the, the great times to be in Vienna, it was called a fan, the fin de siècle, uh, which is, uh, which, which, everybody was roaming, everybody important was roaming the streets of Vienna, uh, uh, whether it was a, uh, uh, Kammer himself or uh, Einstein or Freud or Adolf Hitler, you name it. All the movers and shakers of the 20th century were happening, growing up and, and may, starting to make their mark at that time in Vienna. And uh, and he was uh, uh, worked as a biologist uh, for uh, what was a new idea, which is the biological laboratory that could actually raise uh species in their natural habitat which had never been done because mainly because you couldn't keep the the temperature and the humidity right and so on and so forth so basically uh, biology before that point uh was basically going out shooting things and stuffing them and putting in museums and this was the first time to do actual behavioral uh, uh biology which is a, a brand new and revolutionary thing and he uh, he was known just to introduce him first uh, for uh, having raised a number of species uh, that appeared to when you did something to them, whether you traumatized them, whether you put them in a new uh, a, a new uh, environment, uh, that as they acquired the characteristics of that, that needed to cope with that environment, they would reproduce with those characteristics. Which is not how about Darwinian uh, uh, biology suggests. Uh, Darwinian biology suggests that uh, it happens randomly, uh, and then either that random change takes or it doesn't. Uh, that's pretty much how. And there was another guy named Lamarck who uh, whose theory was that in fact uh, you gain uh, uh, qualities which are then inherited. Uh, based on your experience, uh, there was a great. That was the big debate in in uh, evolution at the time, and evolution was new. Remember, Darwin's it's only for forty years when, when he published this point. So this is like all revolutionary stuff, and therefore worth fighting to the death over, <laughs> as they are today. <laughs> something new will fight to the death, but something old we don't care so much about. So. Uh, that's uh, uh, where he found himself. 
uh, and uh, he had the ability because he was a very good naturalist. He spent his childhood in the woods, uh, uh, digging around and raising animals, and and he could manage to get several generations of a given uh, animal uh, through its paces until it reproduced and reproduced in some cases, not all cases, but in cert certain species, uh, characteristics that it had acquired. Uh, most particularly were the color of salamanders. Salamanders raised on a different color sand will be, will be the color of that sand when they reproduce. Uh, and uh, sea squirts, uh, if you cut off their little little squirt that goes up to the, uh, over the surface, uh, they, they would have truncated squirts afterwards. Mm. Uh, these, these are things that are actually reproducible but haven't been, uh, and they haven't been because he had a magic of, of, uh, of really caring for his animals uh, in a way that nobody else did. And he had a biological institute that put lots of money into it so he had combination of both fantastic uh his he met his uh difficulties over something uh called the midwife toad and the midwife toad was uh, was a, a a toad that uh under certain circumstances when it was uh uh, uh dry it didn't it, 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 it had a little uh, uh toenail basically, you know, uh, 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 that that helped it mate. Basically, when a male would mount, it would, this toenail would be able to grab on and keep, keep, keep the two together until the mating was finished. And uh, in wet circumstances, uh, that was particularly needed. In dry circumstances, it wasn't. Well, uh, that's simplification. Uh, but he raised these and he discovered that uh, uh, under the circumstances when it was changed, the uh, uh, the nuptial pad, as it was called, uh, uh, changed uh, accordingly. And that was like a so, uh, some, another supposed proof of, of Lamarckianism. Well, the problem was back then is that everything was divided into either Darwinism or Lamarckianism. Uh, but science is not quite like that. Uh, but uh, but every 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 level of science, even today, thinks it is thinks that's either the right way or the wrong way, and there's a right school and the wrong school, and that's that. Uh, so basically, he got he got famous for that. Uh, he was a lot of other things. He was a fine musician, wrote a lot of songs, a very popular songwriter in uh, in Vienna. Uh, he's a world travel. He uh, uh, lectured on all of these things and a very magnetic personality. And uh, to finish the, the Toad story, uh, years after World War One, came World War One, and everything got devastated. Everything got blown up. Uh, so all of his uh, 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 results, or mo most of the laboratory results, uh, and the laboratory were pretty well devastated, uh, and there was no way of repeating this at all, even with him. Uh, and e even though the main people who were the anti-Lamarckians or Dar Darwinians, who came from all over, from England, from France, from America, to look at his uh, midwife toad, and they all agreed that he, his results were correct. He had gotten this toad to do this, actually reproduce. Uh, and they all came back after the war when the results were destroyed and said, oh, no, it's th this couldn't be true. And it turns out some, some student or perhaps him, who knows, uh, the, the original specimen, what was left of it, which is mostly decayed, had some marks around where that nuptial pad was. It looked like it had been uh, manipulated or, or uh, added to. And suddenly they said, oh, it was all a fake. It wasn't a fake. They had seen it before. They had agreed with it. But because of political uh, differences, uh, uh, yeah, they yeah. were already dream. Oh, fake, 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 fake. And at this point, the poor man was ruined. Well, uh, so l let me let me jump in because, that. yeah, he so we're, his... we're getting since the rest of it next. But this is the background because otherwise you'll say, oh, well, he was he, he was a, a fake, but he wasn't. Uh, and he wound up committing suicide. 
uh, a few years later, uh, of, of which I won't get into details because there's a strange story around Zach, uh, which get people get hung up. People get hung up about him many for different reasons because he was such an odd and spectacular man. But during all these years, uh, I say it was hello. Are you there? Yeah, there you go. Uh, during all these years, he had been collecting coincidences. Just he'd be sitting around in the park and he noticed people wearing different clothes come by and, and then another set of people. Uh, why are they loading my whiteboard? I don't know. Hello. I'm getting a lot of attention that I should not be getting on my on that. There we go again. Uh, so uh, and and he just started collecting them as an as an interest. And then he, and he noticed they began to happen in patterns, just everything he would see. There, there would be patterns where uh, things would keep recurring uh, and they would recur in different combinations. Uh, and and then they would recur again and they'd be in the same combination, but a, sl a, a slightly different set of them. One thing would happen first, the other thing would happen second, the other happened with third, and then they'd switch places and so on and so forth. Uh, well, he decided that maybe there's an order he had missed in, in the natural order of things. Mathematically, maybe there was an order of information, and information was a big thing happening, beginning to happen at this time. Yeah. Einstein, Einstein would just, had just, in 1905, uh, had just uh, uh, put his first piece out, and his later piece would go out in 1919. So, uh, Kammerer puts all these together uh, into, you know, He's literally collected thousands and thousands of incidents, and he comes up with an idea of uh, basically that things that seem like coincidences, uh, patterns that suddenly appear out of nowhere, aren't apparent. That they, they appear to you to be appearing out of nowhere, but they're not. They're really part of a, a general information system that's mostly going on under under uh, the level of your uh, of your eyesight as it were of your of your consciousness uh, and that every now and then you notice and you say oh my goodness you know it's it's magic and it's treated like magic and 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 my my many people have superstition and so on and and so he came up with a uh, a name for it seriality uh, and in, in German seriality means not just in a row time-wise but in a row space-wise so it means mm -hmm. anything that's connected in, in, in rows in in, 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 uh, in a regular fashion and that was uh, enough for him to write a book about and because it was such a it was, it was covering an area that was so basically non-scientific it had a lot of uh, there was a lot of areas of science uh, that were addressing some of that at the time uh everything from uh, the theory of uh, electromag electromagnetism which was brand new faraday was uh, only had be just been on the scene uh boltzmann and and his and the physics of uh of uh of gas and gas pressure and so on uh and of uh the thermo mainly, mainly thermodynamics had been uh it was all brand new and people were trying to put all these things together in ways all all of which had to do with how large amounts of information came up with individual things that were recognizable so this seemed like a good as, as uh good as good as anything to investigate and he wrote a book called does that does gazettes the siri in 1919 and he wrote it as instead of as a scholastic book. I mean, he'd write, been writing papers, scholastic papers for the institute for years and years and years, uh, and doing lectures and so on, and and writing books. But this was actually a popular book for because it related to some things that people could relate to. People can't relate to, you know, uh, raising salamanders, you know, and on on beds of sand. Nobody's interested in that. But this this is stuff that happens in real life. You know, you think about someone and they and they call you on the phone, you know, and they say, oh, how that happened? Was that was that related? Did they read my mind or it was accidental or was it st a statistical improbability and so on and so forth? Uh, and he came up with a theory that uh, uh, that information itself uh, has has shared certain principles, uh, uh, one of which is 
natural attractions, things that are similar, attract each other, you know, birds of a feather fly together, that kind of thing. Uh, that there was a uh, also a, uh, a, per, a persistence theme, which is basically uh, uh, just the things to remain the way they are. Uh, um, and, and once once a system gets going, it stays that way. And, and th things that we know, you know, you get a corporation, once you get a corporation going on, you, you can never get rid of it. You get some more and more. It, it aggregates. Uh, and that was part of the attraction of, uh, of theory. And the third part was what was called an imitation hypothesis, was that once you got into these relationships, they tended to imitate each other uh, and they would become uh, uh, more like each other and therefore turn up in places that were more similar, both as in similar places and as similar phenomena. So that was basically a three three part uh, uh, approach. And this actually struck the world like wildfire uh, at the time. The book came uh, quite popular. There was even an uh, artistic movement in Paris uh, called the Seriality Movement of painters who uh, they, they felt this was a new way of, of, of approaching the universe, that the universe is revealing itself uh, artistically. Uh, and, uh, uh, and it was very, a very meaningful thing to be connected in, in this kind of fashion. Uh, not oddly, but not oddly. That's very much what Bernie uh, 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 Beitman is doing right now. Uh, yeah which, yeah uh, and they say oh it's meaningful it's 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 connecting you to the the higher principles of this or that well probably so there are higher principles if you don't know how well, they work well, they're higher principles <laughs> so so if, if it's okay let, let me let me jump yeah. in i i want to try and provide some i, I want to try and provide some context for the audience yeah. um mm -hmm. so on your website and i'll put links to this in youtube but yeah. on your website one example that I believe you showed was islands in the ocean, right? And for people who, you know, I, I think we all studied that in school where you've got, uh, you know, molten lava eruptions that lead to uh -huh. these island chains. And as the tectonic plate moves over time, you'll have these islands right. pop up in a row, right? And so right. it's seriality where, you know, you what you see on the surface is a bunch of islands and you see a pattern there and you're like, wow, why is that? Well, the reason right. is there's something deeper that's hidden that's going on underneath. Mm -hmm. Now, like another example of this might be, and again, this is, this is pretty mundane stuff, but okay. You see a lot of people carrying around calculators, right? And you're like, well, why is that? Oh, well, because it's tax season. Okay. So, so you've got kind of this, hidden variable under the surface that's influencing something that's observed and you see these patterns but one thing that you'd mentioned was for instance someone calling you when you go to call them that has happened to me dozens if not hundreds of times i think it's happened to most people so yes. does seriality include what we would think of as like psychic events this is a this is a problem that that i'm still hashing out with Bernie and uh and uh and, and we take completely opposite uh, uh uh views upon uh I take I really go straight from camera and stay that way because camera didn't believe in any anything paranormal at all mm. he was a, a natural scientist he believed it was all scientifically descriptive if you just knew what was going on uh as I do, you know, and that doesn't prevent her from being higher powers or God or Brahma himself or whatnot, uh, interfering as part of it uh, or being part of it. Uh, but it's still knowable and it's there. Uh, uh, it's not a separate world that, yeah. uh, that you have to invoke somehow. Uh, and it's not something that is dependent on humans either. It's something that's a part of a natural order. Uh, now, uh, when you look at something, particularly uh, phone calls from people and the most common kind, uh, you know, I mean, everybody thinks of someone and they get a phone call from them, you know, seriality really happens to everybody. Uh, it, and one of the reasons why it's so easy to be popular is because it is a universal experience. So uh, the, the most common and, and sometimes sad uh uh, way that it happens to a lot of people and now that we have much greater data sets you know, a lot of the things that were mysterious before 
uh, are no longer mysterious because we got enough data sets to see that so many people have seen them that yes, they weren't their imagination, they weren't making it up, they weren't a bunch of goofballs, it was real, they really did see it, you just don't see them that often, you know. Yeah. The or, earliest example was was a, a gorillas in Africa, people used to think that was a complete, you know, uh, back in the 1700s, that's just people's sailors' imagination. Nope, gorillas, they're there, big hairy men, oh my goodness. They used to think ships disappearing with with monster waves in the ocean. Old sailors' tale, terrible sailors. They don't know whether they're, they're just making it up. No, come not, finally in the 1950s when one ship was split up and there were survivors. They described it. Now they know that there are such things as monster waves, and they've taken down a lot of ships. And they even have the the, the uh, analysis of the waveforms that do that, or part of it. It's not finished yet. Uh, but that's what's something when something went from supposed superstition to, oh, yeah, there is an explanation for it. We just didn't know it. Well, it's the same problem uh, is existent in a lot of places that we have been calling paranormal. Uh, that we got so many examples of UFOs are the latest, uh, the, 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 the hottest. But uh, uh, one of them uh, is is people communicating to other people through dreams either through the future or uh, through dreams or th in the present through dreams. And those dreams are so frequently, the majority of those dreams are about tragedy. They're about someone sick and they hear from them psychically. You know, uh, you know, uh, oh, I just, uh, I just had a terrible feeling about my mother. And then my sister called to say my mother died when I had that feeling right when I was having it. Uh, I had an example of myself. I, I was uh, uh, in uh, I, living, living in New York. I grew up in Miami in Coconut Grove, and my parents still lived there. And when I was uh, in, in New York, uh, one morning at 6 a.m. sharp, I woke up. I, I just woke up with this terrible dream that I was back in my bathroom in Florida and that I had just gotten up and I had urinated blood. And I was terribly alarmed by it, you know, naturally, as one would be. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I called up my mother that evening just to say hi in general and, and how are you doing? And, and she said, well, we're, we're not that really OK, because your, your father woke up this morning at six o'clock and went into the bathroom and urinated blood at six. You know, it happened no, exactly what, the same time. So what what's to explain that? You know, uh, well, some kind of communication was going on, obviously, uh, to anyone, you know, because this kind of thing happens all the time when you have uh, 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 people in, in extremity of one sort or another to so, communicate to people who are dear to them that there's a problem. <clears throat> yeah. So let me let me inter let me interject for a minute. Um, and, and I believe, uh, again, Dr. Dr. Bernard Beitman, right? He's he's described Bernard, yeah. that in particular as what he calls, I think, sympathy, right? Um, yeah. You know, and again, my, my own mother, and this is a story she's told me many times. Uh -huh. um, she had a tremendous pain in her hand when she was young, yeah. right? And for some reason, she had this notion in her mind that it was connected to her mother. And right. so she called her mother, who lived in another state, who had just burned her hand very badly cooking right. and had the same pain in the same place at the same time. Right. Okay. And so all of us have had things like that. Now, l let me let me delineate that against for, for things that, that could be explained a little bit more easily. For instance, um, my my girlfriend and I, my girlfriend lives in, in a different location. We mm -hmm. text each other very frequently right throughout the day yeah. and it's very common for me to go to text her and she'll say oh my god i was just going to text you well mm -hmm. it could be because we tend to chat every hour to two hours yeah. and so if she hasn't heard from me she's starting to think about it if i haven't heard from her vice versa that makes sense just in terms of psychology and timing certainly but does these random events, right? Like yeah. you're talking about urinating right. blood or yeah. hands. Do you think that is, again, Calmer wouldn't say that was psychic, but is there another uh, way to no, explain it? No, uh, uh, the camera would not say it was serial. Uh, I don't say it's serial. Bernie okay. does. 
uh, and Bernie, and, but he's very fortunate. He puts in front of it because he he started off his theorizing not from camera. He'd never heard of camera. I introduced him to camera. Uh, uh, was is is Carl Jung and Carl Jung and Pauli, the physicists, got together in '52 and they wrote a piece about what Jung called synchronicity, which was things that are meaningful, particularly in psych in psychiatric situations, uh, that uh, bring forth realizations, uh, accidental things that bring forth realizations, and the the, the the uh, Egyptian gold bug, uh, the beetle example, is, is yes. a common one, which uh, is always used, and that's what Jung started out with. Uh, and and fortunately, Bernie puts in front of it meaningful coincidence, because that's what he's talking about. Where is he coming from? He's a psychologist, of course. I mean, to a certain extent, uh, everybody's looking at all these phenomena from different areas. Uh, it's like the wise men looking at the elephant, you know. And he's a he's a psychiatrist. He's looking. He's feeling the elephant's heart. Right? He says, "Oh, it's about the heart and the mind." You know, some other physicist is feeling the tusk and saying, "Oh no, it's about the hard physics of the thing." You know, other ones are looking at the feet and say, "Oh no, this is about how information travels," et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in the case of uh, what are obviously phone calls from people in extremity on limited lines i mean they they usually happen they don't they may happen between people uh, who don't know each other at all because people are often having dreams about terrible things that happen to people they don't know but they said they don't know them they don't know whether it's a, just their own imagination or whatnot but when it's about your mother or your, you know father or whatever you know then then you know that it's the real thing uh and the it's, you, you, it seems to be confined to confined to people who are either uh, either know each other friends very, very well people who are in, in very close contact and and their own information set through their life information set is similar uh, throughout their lives uh, so they're they're on a wavelength as it were or they're on a, on their own private network or they they've got their own phone line or whatever you might how you might think of it in older technology uh, so uh, so that's really what's happening there I don't think that's the reality I don't think it's part of it, it it's a small part of, a, of of larger information systems that we don't know about yet okay yeah but it's not the thing you know it's it's not the larger picture it's a part of that larger picture yeah, and that that makes that makes complete sense so seriality is um yeah, you're talking about seriality is structure beneath the bits that we see, and those bits they they have maybe some meaning, and there's they're correlated, but there's a randomness to them, and the randomness again, like the islands popping up in the middle of the ocean, what we see is a bunch of islands. We say this doesn't right. make much sense, but beneath that there is a mm -hmm. structure that's producing them. Right. So yeah, so, and there's a that that's a, a a good double. I use that for a good double reason because. We don't know the answer to that for two different reasons. One is that oh, we see now that uh, that uh, 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 it's a hot spot being moved over by a crust yes. plate. Uh, I was brought up by my father, who was uh, raised in the twenties. With crustal plate theory before it was before it was known, it had just become out in 1920, uh, and he used to point out to me, "Oh, see how South America and North America they, and Africa they fit together? Yeah, well, that's how things that probably really are." Well, no one bought that at that time. That wasn't accepted until the late 1950s, uh, and and that's the only way you can explain a hot spot. But you still can't explain a hot spot. So why is there a hot spot there? What is a hot spot? You got the crustal plate, and you think, oh, well, now they got it covered. It's just a crustal plate going all over a what? Where'd the hotspot come from? You still don't know. You got two different sets of information you don't really know. Uh, and that happens in seriality all the time. You don't know. There's a, there's a lot of information going on, a lot of structural information in the environment that is some of it's plain to you because you're you deal in it every day. Language is part of it. Mathematics is part of it. 
Uh, that's why people see a lot of numbers will repeat all the time, because language and mathematics are very close to each other. They started in, in, in ancient Greece, uh, numbers and, and letters were the same thing. Uh, alpha was one, beta was two, and so on and so forth. Well, so... Uh, it's and a you have example. Okay. If it's okay, I, 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 you mentioned the numbers. I want to get in one that I have been seeing, and there, there actually is significant meaning to this that I'm not going to go into on air. But, um, yeah. I've been seeing eleven, eleven, right? And, mm. um, you know, it, it, this, this is something that, um, I, you know, it comes and it goes. I guess, uh, it, it started a couple of years ago. I've done some research on it, you know, and th there's, there's all sorts of explanations online. But one of the things that had occurred to me was there is a fairly rational explanation. Actually, I've heard two of them. Um, a lot of people have reported seeing the number 1111. You'd mentioned this before the interview. It stands out because the way it looks, right? So people see it. And right. once people see it, they start to ascribe meaning and they train themselves to see it every time it pops up. Sure. So. So mm -hmm. part of it is, I believe you use the word psychological projection, where you see it and you say, that means something. And then you see it again and you say, oh, that reinforces the meaning. And before you know it, you see it everywhere. And then over time, As it gradually it, fades away, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, and 1111 uh, happens to be one, because it's so obvious, yeah. uh, that it happens to more people more of the time. You see a lot of people with the 1111 syndrome, as it were, within seriality. Uh, they, they see it keeps popping up. It must mean something. Uh, but that's not the only one. There are people in, uh, in some of uh, Bernie's, Bernie's little encounter classes he has, uh, uh, you know, I ran across one person who was the, 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 the number six kept turning up, you know, and it would be always mean something. It's just several sixes would come and sometime and then something important would happen, you know, and then it could, it could be it could be any number. Uh, and the, the more unlikely the number, the more probably likely it is that there's some serial uh, attachment to it uh, or there may be none. Also, there's an odd thing. There's a lot of subsets. The more you look at seriality, the more you realize how many subsets of information you're dealing with. You're not dealing with one package. You're dealing with a lot of different uh, incoming, uh, both small pieces and large packages of information. Uh, and, uh, and you may have uh, 111 happen 15 times and 20 times and it's kind of like when a hurricane's coming along if you've ever uh, been through a hurricane I, I grew up on a boat and i've always been on the coast uh, and, I, and i've been through a lot of hurricanes and they're very exciting because because they have these precursors first a little puff of wind and it's a weird puff of, it's not like your regular puff of wind it's like a little aggressive puff of wind and then it stops dead and then there's a little wisp of clouds and maybe a little drop or two and then you can feel the pressure dropping. Uh, and then there'll be another one from a slightly different direction. And it'll be, again, an aggressive little puff of wind and then stop. You know, normally wind, it comes and it goes, you know, and you feel it. It's, it's a strong wind, but it's little bits and pieces as if it's trying to put together a bigger Whoa. puzzle. Uh, and eventually, all of those pieces get more and more and more and more of them. And eventually, you get a hurricane. Or... May a hurricane may be passing by, and you get some of them, but not all of them. You don't get to the hurricane's eye, and you think, after you've seen these things for a while, you think, well, a hurricane's coming, and then, well, it doesn't come. Maybe that's not what it means. Well, it is what it means. It's just you miss the middle of it. Uh, and the same is true of seriality. You can have a lot of you can have a lot, a lot of signs and symbols come along, uh, and then nothing happened. Uh, but as often as, as more often than ought to be, something then really does turn up. Uh, and then you find, well, okay, now, now I know I'll keep an eye out for the next time. Yeah, well, exactly, exactly. Right. And, you know, and what, what I found is, and a lot of people have mentioned this, they've said that something did happen. There was meaning there. This happened in the past, right? In right. my case, that was the case as well, where mm -hmm. there was meaning behind this. And so, right. you know, what, when, when it starts to happen again, you say, well, you know what, right. I'm, I'm, you know, but it is interesting the way that you've mentioned hurricanes and, and how that might apply to seriality. In my case, and, and I'm sure you remember this as well, um, when I was a kid, the old timers would talk about 
people who could like read the trees for weather right sure. and mm -hmm. I, I i'm in the i'm in the seattle area you know and so when we get pacific storms coming in um the way you describe hurricanes for us it's it's a little bit different the sky will start to get a little bit of a different color you know sometimes it'll be sunny but there's there's a little bit of a change there and yeah. and then one of the big ones of course is the leaves curl up and so on all the right. all the deciduous trees right all the leaves start to turn mm -hmm. kind of white right. and you can just say you know you're like okay there's a storm coming and people who aren't familiar or people from other parts of the country will go how do you know that you know it looks right. great you know i know and a few hours yeah. later it's there so yeah, exactly you know uh and and that's that is a sort of universal truth that we see parts or enough of parts of stuff to notice that it's that something's coming or something's brewing and maybe it doesn't you know maybe you don't get all of it and maybe it, you misses uh and then again maybe it hits right on uh and you and you really don't know uh the only thing you have to watch out for and this is again where uh i'll be distinct from bernie as he's using he uses more of the word synchronicity because he's pulling it from young uh and he makes it personal because he thinks that all these things have to have personal meaning i don't think they do at all i think these are just phenomena yeah uh, and they may and if it's personal to you good for you now you're involved with that phenomena personally but it may not be it may be involved with the person next door uh, uh there are people there are people themselves actually who attract seriality uh i i run into them every now and then i'm always amazed that you know you just you just get in their presence and serial things start to happen uh and then they pass they go on go next door and you don't see them anymore and it's, they're not happening anymore i don't know why that happens but there but it's certainly uh, that that a, almost a sounds like what they call the hitchhiker effect though and this is something that comes out of the ufo area where yeah again yeah it seems yes. like it's attached mm -hmm. to certain people right exactly it can be de attached to certain people certain people have certain uh, uh more abilities to to get the input i mean we only have certain amounts of input that we can recognize and therefore turn into ideas language so on and so forth we can hear from 20,000 cycles down to uh, about uh, you know to about 20, 000, to 20 cycles and anything above that we can't hear on uh, anything below that we can't but elephants hear it below uh, all kinds of bats and everything else hear it above there are things that can hear in microwaves uh, there are, uh, there are all kinds of things going on that we're not privy to uh, yeah. all kinds of information that we may be more privy to than we even know about. Uh, and some of that may be uh, uh, atavistic, meaning that it comes from earlier days when they were uh, finer tuned abilities to avoid predators. Uh, I mean, for, for instance, I mean, if you're walking, you're walking down Serengeti Plain uh, and you, there's a bush over there. And you get this feeling, I don't think I'm going to go by that bush. It's got a bad feeling about that bush. And you go off to the left and you're fine. Next, next, the next monkey comes along. We're going to be human being sometime, but he's not going to be human being because he goes right by that bush. The lion gets him. That's it. And he doesn't reproduce. And that's the it, end of it. exactly. Yes. I was going to say there's, there's definitely an evolutionary selection for these, you know, and, and then it seems like there's a balance between, because a, a lot of this in humans comes down to pattern matching, right? Yeah, and, exactly. and you know and if if the pattern matching isn't sensitive enough you don't notice that the bush the the reeds are waving a little different like something's yeah. hiding in it but right. if the pattern matching is too sensitive you can't walk in a straight path because every bush that you see looks exactly. like it has something in exactly. it right so you're always you're always a middle ground of pattern recognition pattern recognition is everything for the brain it's for and and it's what you tune out what you do your your basic codec your uh that you use in a computer is the imitation of our neural network of pattern matching. Yeah. Uh, the same, same with a uh, codex for uh, compression for uh, audio is the same thing. You just leave out whole patches uh, because they're, uh, they're too much. You can't, you can't fit them through the pipeline, uh, but you don't need all of them, you know, on some of the, the fact, the very fact that you don't need some of them is uh, uh, the, the, one of the good examples is, is the the gorilla gorilla in the midst experiment, which I'm sure everybody's heard of, where where they marched the gorilla across the basketball court, 
uh, and uh, and because everybody's counting, they, they're try counting the score and they're told to count the score uh, and to keep a very close match on the score because they're going to get rewarded or whatnot. And a guy in a gorilla suit walks right across the front stage and nobody notices him because everybody's watching what they're supposed to be watching. Uh, and and that's part of, uh, of of the phenomenon here uh, is that we tune out a lot of stuff that we don't need anymore. Yes. Uh, uh, and we don't. And, and some of that comes back to us anyway, because it's uh, because it is heritable. Uh, oh, and, and by the way, going going just running back to uh, uh, camera just to give him a, another the final good lick uh the, the it turns out yes you can there are there are heritable acquired characteristics and it's called epigenetics and he is now called yes. the, fa the father of epigenetics is paul cameron now he was run out of town for discovering it and wound up committing suicide and now he is the person who 20 who 100 years before predicted what they were just finding out now you know so uh, uh, and a lot of that, as he said back then, he said, what I have discovered will not be understood for 100 years. And it's been 100 years since his death. So I think we're beginning to find out a lot of what he had already imagined uh, and theorized. Uh, uh, but we're coming up with enough technology to be able to recognize the signs when we see them and be able to select them out. Uh, so some of them, you know, uh, I think I use seriality as Cameron did as a big picture, as, a, as painting the, the, the whole picture of all of the things that we don't, we're not getting all of the input from, but that are there. Uh, in the case of Bernie, he, he, he segments out a lot and he makes it very personal, that it's supposed to be a psychological thing. Uh, and and that's very good and and it's, and it's very sellable. It's much more sellable than what I'm talking about. You yes. Know, because it, it could, because I mean, just the, the last lecture on it was well, well, uh, take serial. Whenever seriality happens to you, this shows that there's a, a higher power, and therefore you should be more positive thinking. And, and you can get you know, and it goes and, and suddenly starts to become positivism and positive thinking and visualization and all this other stuff that is well, much of it is hucksterism. And, and, and so if, if I can, and I'm, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but the, the takeaway that I have is um, psychic is psychic. It may or may not be real. It's a different topic. Seriality is, is science and mathematics, chaos and complexity theory that he developed a hundred years before those were really developed. Right. Yeah, and and what he what he did, he didn't develop complexity theory or or fractals or uh, chaos theory, but he he said they were coming. He said, yes. this is how this is how they're structured. You can have an attractor. You don't see any of the factors around uh, a, a a a chaotic attractor. You don't see any of the factors unless you mathematize and then put the data together and then they show right up on a graph and you can see them all of a sudden the whole pattern's right there but there's no way you can see them otherwise and he was saying that basically uh and and therefore he presaged what was going to become up in the 1970s basically in 80s uh and so uh and i use seriality as a as the overview of all of that now there's many individual things that you're going to find out about uh, seeing bits and pieces of the future, uh, particularly group, get large data groups of people looking at the future. You get a lot more accuracy about it. There's some good experiments being done on that. Uh, also, uh, just well, I, I mentioned to you in, in print. I think my uh, my own experiences of, of I'll walk into a dream that I had uh, six six months ago. It won't be any special dream, just a dream of someone that I'm talking to in a living room with some furniture and so on. And I'll recognize I'll recognize the dream. I say, Oh yeah, I was talking to so and so and so. And and it suddenly and I walk into that dream. It took like today or tomorrow. Uh, and. And right afterwards, something awful happens. <laughs> something, you know, not, some, not something deathly awful, but sunstroke was one of them. Uh, an economic disaster was another one. The terrible, what could have been a terrible professional embarrassment uh, uh, and so on. And I learned to discover that when, for whatever reason, when these things 
that I had dreamt about, which are just normal, everyday, conversational kind of things. They're not special dreams. They're just whatever your brain is doing when it's, when it's uh, in REM, you know, uh, uh, that, that that this was when they pop up something, something's afoot. You hit a time spot, which is, is not a, a linear time spot. It's like a three-dimensional time spot where there's any way you can go. You can go this way, you can go that way, you can go this way. And one of them is going to be a disaster. So it's hot enough to have pick, been picked up beforehand. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, and yeah. now when, like, when, like... That, you know, when that happens, now I stop dead. I say, look around. There's something wrong here. Find out what it is and, and fix it. And every time there is something wrong, I do fix it and everything's fine. And so I haven't had the problem ever since. But for the first few times, it, it turned out to be, you know, it's, it's a warning system I didn't know I had. Now I know I have it. It's very useful. Uh, is, is it going to work every time? Who knows? But it's, it's just part of a fascinating study. That is serial, uh, seriality of a different sort. But it has to do with how time is connected and whether time is, as some pe people try to make it one dimensional, or whether it's actually three dimensional. Uh, if you take a, a, I challenge people to go back and read Abbott's Flatland. If you haven't read Flatland, you should. Yeah. And uh, actually what you're, what you're alluding to, and actually I have an interview coming up later in the week about this, mm -hmm. um, the block universe model. Exactly. And if you use the block universe model, uh, take F Abbott's Flatland and apply that to time instead of the three spaces, apply that to the three dimensions of time. Not only do you have a block universe, but you have a malleable block universe that you're actually traveling through. And these kind of things are the very things that happen in it. Uh, I've got a link, uh, I think, uh, maybe I sent you the link that's on, it's on my site. There's a, there's a nice uh, thought uh, 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 example, you know, a, 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 a thought experiment on that that tells you how to think about it. It's kind of like Einstein's elevator uh, uh, thought example, a good one that says, oh, well, if it works, works this way, then how about that way? Uh, so it's worth, uh, it's, worth, it's worth thinking about that because all of these are parts of, of what camera was painting as seriality and they're, and they're not limited. They're in fact, to just how information organizes itself. Uh, and, and things we don't know yet about how well and how sophisticatedly it does. And the fact that we can pick up some of it is amazing. It's wonderful. And I hope that we find out more of exactly what it is we're missing uh, in terms of the input. So we can, ex you know, we can magnify the input, amplify the input, pick it up where it isn't uh, and, uh, and, and get a little better at that. Uh, it'll be very useful if we do. Wonderful. On that note, John, mm -hmm. let me thank you so much for your time today. It has truly been Delightful. a pleasure and an honor having you here. I, the, the the depth of the study and thought that you've put into this is is amazing. So let me thank you yet again for your time today, sir. Uh, I'm delighted. I hope to, hope to see you again.